The markets have been hitting all-time highs. It's been pretty exciting for those of us in the markets. Some people are pretty nervous out here. We're getting mixed signals from the Fed. Let's talk to an expert. Let's talk to uh, Matt Van Alstyne. He's from the Odeon Capital Group, and he's with us right here in the studio. Matt, thank you for being with us today. Glad to be here. Matt, uh, you're a chartered financial analyst uh, like myself, uh, so I know you've done the hard work here. Here we are, all-time highs for the market. We seem to keep pushing higher. Walk me through your thought process. Are we going higher or not? Well, I think we're going to continue going higher as long as the Fed continues buying bonds. They've hinted that they're going to end tapering or begin tapering their purchases, but they're still purchasing. And as long as that continues, I think that there's a dearth of asset classes for people to invest in, and that leads them to invest in stocks and leads the markets to all-time highs. If this is a Fed-led market, then we're obviously very dependent on, on Ben Bernanke. And I remember the markets got spooked back, uh, I believe it was June, the FOMC meeting. We really took a dive. And then one by one, we had a Fed governor after Fed governor kind of walk back those comments. And then, lo and behold, uh, a couple of weeks later, even, even Chairman uh, Bernanke came out and said, we're kind of in this for the long term. Which is it? You know, are they unwinding QE or, or are they going to just keep pressing on? Exactly. That's the problem the market has. I think, I mean, if you go back many years, this is actually the third or fourth summer season in a row where the Fed has tried to end their direct involvement in keeping the economy afloat. And then you, that's why you've had QE1 and QE2. You know, QE1 was originally named quantitative easing because there wasn't supposed to be a two. Then there was QE2 and then obviously QE3. And QE3, There, some people think there's even been QE4 because of how they walked back the end of QE3. So every time they come on the brink of you know, ending their involvement in the markets, um, the markets scare them back into continuing it. They, they get scared, but, you know, the bond markets uh, really took a dive. And for a lot of our viewers out there, a lot of people need safe investments. They were really hammered after, after that Fed meeting. Uh, interest rates are still very low, and, and some say the Fed has really hurt savers, uh, especially seniors who rely on things like CDs. They don't have a choice. They're being forced into the stock market, maybe at a time when it's a little bit too dangerous. What kind of signal they, do you need for your investors to say, no mas, I'm out of here? Well, in the stock market, um, it would be the Fed walking away. Walking away, beginning tapering. But haven't they set up the beginning of the end of, of that right now? If I they mean, mean it. Well, it, do they mean it? or Are they telling us the truth or not? Um, it seems like he mean, Ben Bernanke means it this time. I mean, his term is ending. Uh, Mr. Obama made it clear he didn't want him back. So he's going to be setting up his successor with a legacy. And I suspect that he doesn't want that legacy to be immediately ending everything that he put in place. And he'd probably want to commence it before he leaves. All right. That brings up an important point, because the two names that are, that are being brought up are, of course, Janet Yellen, uh, who's currently there, and, uh, and a name from the past, a name we haven't heard for a long time, Larry Summers. Seems like a very political move on the president's uh, part. Any ideas who's likely to be the next uh, chairman? Well, if it's either of those two, they're actually quite disparate in what supposedly they would do. Um, Larry Summers is definitely a partisan Democrat who would probably act in the best interest of the Democrat Gee, Party. Gee, I, I wonder why Larry Summers' name is coming up here. But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just, I think, but Janet Yellen's been at the Fed for 20-something years and has supported all of Ben Bernanke's moves. So you might see more consistency if she's named than, than Larry Summers. When I talk to market professionals, they seem to lean towards Janet Yellen. Uh, she's been there. She's a banker. Uh, and Larry is very much a political political animal. How do you think the markets will react if Larry Summers, Summers is named the, the new chairman of the Fed? Well, the markets just want transparency. They want predictability. So if he's named, I don't know if it, that in and of itself is a disaster for the markets as long as he gets you know, confirmed in a rapid fashion and is in clairvoyant into what he wants to do. Let me take it back to the markets uh, for a second, because we are in the middle of e earnings seasons, and one of the big driving forces for markets is not even just the United States. It's outside, uh, outside our markets, and in, pr I'm, in principle, I'm, I'm talking about China. We've seen a dramatic slowdown in China, and that seems to have riled our markets because, in fact, we sell to these Asian countries. And I sometimes question, how are, you, how are U.S. multinational companies doing so well if the emerging markets, led by China, are actually slowing down. Uh, the emerging markets haven't done well at all this year. China seems to be uh, really hitting the skids right now. What does that mean for our market? 
Well, there, there's two different things. The markets are one thing, but it's actual consumer activity where we, where American companies sell their goods into emerging market company, and emerging market um, consumers, and the consumer market has not gone nearly as poorly as the stock markets in the emerging market. So as long as we're selling our goods at a competitive price, you know, we'll do just fine. And the dollar's been helping because it's been relatively weak. All right. Uh, let's get some tips here. What do you like in this market right now? Maybe a sector or even a stock pick or an ETF? Well, we like the coal sector right now. It's been the coal. Hold on. Stop the presses here. The coal sector. This has been decimated, the coal sector. Yep, correct. It's been decimated, but we think it's near the bottoms, and um, the 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 internals will come back pretty strong. I think it got hit also because of fear of the EPA overreach, but it seems like that's not going to be the case. Yeah, but let me take you to Washington for a second. I mean, you, you have an administration that's almost dedicated their presidency to driving this sector in, in, into into the ground. They're you know very beholden to the green energy lobby. Uh, Coal is certainly not a, a super clean fuel, and we hear words like clean coal. We know there's probably no such thing as clean coal. It's a dirty fuel, no question about it. How are they going to buck up against, you know, a Democratic administration? Well, it's interesting when ideals meet facts. The fact is that a good portion of our electricity in the United States comes from coal, and we don't have any ready alternatives. So if you destroyed the coal industry, you're destroying the entire U.S. economy and the entire in electrical infrastructure of the U.S. economy. Well, then walk me through this, uh, because I, over the last couple of years, I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, elect uh, electric utilities actually start to transition from coal to natural gas. We seem to have an abundance of natural gas as well. Yeah, that's true. And natural gas is likely going to continue to be the, the uh, new um, factory of choice or the new electrical production f plant of choice. Well, Boone Pickens would like that. He's been pushing his, uh, his plan for, for a pretty long time. But, you know, we seem to be able to, you know, it seems to be there. And I guess the question is, you know, will we put the energy policies in place to become energy in independent? I actually saw something just recently uh, today. It kind of struck me. I may even talk about it a little, a little later. Uh, uh, Prince Alawid uh, from Saudi Arabia saying that fracking, in fact, is uh, destroying the amount of oil that they're able to sell. I think that's a good thing, isn't it? Isn't it? Uh, the, it's destroying the Saudi Arabians? Yeah, I mean, why, why, look at if we can produce more oil, isn't that a good thing for us? Oh, I think energy independence is a, an ideal that the, the American well, people have been chasing for quite some time. I would think natural gas, fracking, and all these things, including coal, would be part of that equation. Uh, I'm not sure we have an energy policy in, in place to do that. But let me go to another topic, because I don't want to just talk about stocks, because frankly, Stocks are not really appropriate for everybody. What can somebody listening at home right now, elderly, need some steady income, an alternative to fixed income, anything income producing? Well, I think fixed income is a good alternative to stocks. But how do you do that without losing your capital, given that what interest rates are doing? Well, you don't lose your capital when you buy bonds. The actual the benefit of a, of a corporate bond as you get. talk about that explain why you don't lose your capital if you buy the individual bond it's important because you get your capital returned to you at the date of maturity of the bond so there's there's a bunch of bonds I mean the bond market's bigger than the stock market if you include treasuries um, and you go out you buy the bond and you pick a maturity date and you get your coupon plus your principal back on the end of maturity as long as it doesn't default so it comes down to picking companies that are you know have strong balance sheets and good prospects but the difference between the stock market and the bond market is the the return or the you know promised return of capital. The big mistake, sorry, the go ahead, big no, go mistake ahead. investors yeah. make is by buying bond funds That's what I or by hear. buying okay. ETFs and thinking that they're getting exposure to the high yield market. If you're buying an ETF, you're getting day-to-day -day movement or you're capturing that. That's not owning bonds. If you're buying a bond fund, you're relying on the bond manager to be prudent, which is a little bit safer than the ETFs, but you still have to sell. I think that brings up a, a very important point, the difference between a bond fund and, and, a, and a bond is that in the bond you do get your money your money back. It brings up another type of bond. We're going to be talking about this uh, later in our program. We're going to be talking about Detroit, and we've seen what's happened in the municipal market. You know, Detroit going into bankruptcy is a serious event. Have you seen you know eruptions within the municipal market? Oh yeah, the municipal market's gotten crushed, but it started getting crushed before Detroit filed it. It began with the Fed's comments on tapering. Um, for some reason, but all, bond, all bonds got crushed during correct. that. Correct, but uh, the junk bond market, high yield bonds, and 
investment grade bond market has come back a lot faster than the municipal bond is still it's now trailing where it used to be versus it, those. It brings up an important issue because in, in Detroit, if the bondholders get crushed in a bankruptcy like this, doesn't this translate to every other municipality out there? If this works for Detroit, a bankruptcy, why can't I do it too? Because there's a lot, a lot of them that are on the edge. And my question is, what does it mean for the healthy cities that have to go back to the, to the capital markets? What are they going to do to raise capital? Well, rates are going to be higher. I mean, but that's probably the nature of the market anyway. I, it's hard to compare every city because each city is different. It's municipal leadership. If you have it and you have responsible mayors and city councils and, and the like, then you're less likely to have this problem. <laughs> if you have irresponsibility like Detroit had, they had 20 years of single-party leadership. I don't think there's been a Republican city councilman there in decades. Um, you're right. You're right, of course. Matt, very well said. We're going to have to have you back again soon, Matt. Thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate it. Great being here. Thanks. We've been talking with Matt.